We are already very familiar with Newton's second law that the resultant force acting on the object in a vector form equals to m its mass multiplied by its acceleration a, also a vector that has the same direction as the resultant force. And also from kinematics, we know that acceleration is defined as the time derivative of velocity vector. Therefore, by combining these two equations and multiplied dt to both sides of this equation, and now we can integrate both sides of this equation for a process from state 1 to state 2. On the left-hand side, this expression is integrated from the initial time t1 to the final time t2. On the right-hand side, the expression is integrated from the initial velocity v1 to the final velocity v2. And the right-hand side equals to mv2 minus mv1 since m is a constant. And we can define a new parameter to replace this mv. It is known as the linear momentum L equals to m times velocity v. L and v are both vectors. And for the left-hand side, we can define a new parameter as well to replace this integration term, which is called the linear impulse I, which equals to the integration of a force with respect to time for a process. Therefore, the previous equation can now be written as the principle of linear impulse and momentum. The summation of I, which is the total linear impulse caused by external forces associated with the process from state 1 to state 2, equals to the change in the particle's linear momentum, L. Here, we need to emphasize the word linear because we will learn about angular impulse and angular momentum later. You might notice a similarity of this equation with the principle of work and energy. Despite the similarity in the format of these two equations, the left-hand side of these two equations are parameters both caused by external forces, and also they are both associated with a process. For the right-hand side, the two parameters are both associated with the state of the particle. The difference is, as you can tell, that the principle of work and energy is a scalar equation. Both work and energy are scalar properties. However, the principle of linear impulse and momentum is a vector equation since both impulse and momentum are vectors. The principle of linear impulse and momentum is normally written in this way to show a direct relation of how external forces are changing the velocity of the particle. And because this is a vector equation, it can be rewritten into three scalar equations along the x, y, and z direction respectively. The principle of linear impulse and momentum can also be applied to a system of particle. Here, the total impulse term includes all the impulse caused by external forces acting to this system, and for the linear momentum term, m is the total mass of all the particles in the system, and vg is the velocity of the mass center of the system. Let's revisit this slightly modified example that we worked on before using equations of motion. Here, we have three toy cars connected together. They're being pulled by a constant force of 3.5 Newton, and we need to determine their velocity after two seconds. Now, for this problem, we're looking at a direct correlation of a force, time, and speed. In other words, we know that this force of 3.5 Newton has been applied to this system of cars for two seconds, and we want to find out how that changes the velocity of the system. Therefore, the most ideal way to solve this problem is by applying the principle of linear impulse and momentum, since that provides this relation between force, time, and speed. We still start with the free body diagram of this system, but since there is only motion along the horizontal direction, therefore, we only need to write the principle of linear impulse and momentum in a scalar form along the x direction. Substitute in the information. The initial velocity is zero, 
The force is constant, therefore its impulse on the system is simply determined by its magnitude 3.5 multiplied the time, 2 seconds, and that equals to the total mass of the system multiplied by the final velocity, which is our unknown. So from this equation, we can simply solve Vx2 to be 20 meter per second. I encourage you to try to solve this problem using equations of motion and compare the methods to see which method is simpler. Let's revisit another example. For this problem, we need to determine the power of the force at time equals to 6 seconds. And power is determined by the magnitude of the force multiplied by the velocity. And if you recall, when we first solved this problem before, we used not only equation of motion, but also kinematics. Here, let's try to solve this problem using the principle of linear impulse and momentum. So we still start with the free body diagram of the crate, and we still need to determine at what time motion starts. In other words, we need to determine at what point the maximum static frictional force between the crate and the surface is overcome. And as you can see, here we have exactly the same approach to determine this time using equilibrium equations. And you might argue, how come we don't apply the principle of linear impulse and momentum here? I want you to be careful when you are working with static frictional force, because here what we have is only the maximum static frictional force. If you remember, static frictional force is not a constant and is always determined through equilibrium. After motion has started, since there is only motion along the x-direction, we can write the principle of linear impulse and momentum along the x-direction only in scalar form. Therefore, we substitute in what we know. The first term is zero because the initial speed is zero. This term right here is the total impulse caused by the external force, the applied force, during this process integrated from when t equals to 3.255 seconds, this is when motion starts, to when t equals to 6 seconds. This term right here is the total impulse caused by the gravitational force during this process. And this term right here is the total impulse caused by the kinetic frictional force during this process. And that equals to the final linear momentum which is the mass 50 multiplied by the, the speed along the x direction, which is our unknown. And this equation, although it looks complicated, it only has one unknown, and this unknown v can be determined from this equation to be 4.18 meter per second. And since at t equals to 6 seconds, the magnitude of the force is 440 newton, therefore the power can be calculated to be 1.84 kilowatt which is the same answer as what we got before in the previous video using the equations of motion plus kinematics. Let's look at this example. Two blocks are connected through cable pulley system. Initially, block A has a speed of 3 meter per second. We need to determine the speed of block B at t equals to 6 seconds. There is kinetic friction between block A and the surface. This is a problem that can be solved using equations of motion, but since again we're looking at a direct correlation between speed and time, therefore we're going to use the principle of linear impulse and momentum to solve this problem. So we start with the free body diagram of block A. The force T is the tension force in the cable, and force FF is the kinetic frictional force between the block and the surface. And since there is no motion along the y direction, we can apply equilibrium equation to solve for the frictional force to be 12.74 newton. And since there is only motion along the x direction, we can apply the principle of linear impulse and momentum again in scalar form along the x direction, substitute in all the known information, and we get this equation with two unknowns, t again, the tension force, and vax2, which is the speed of the block at the final state. Then we draw the free body diagram of block B. Notice here the tension force associated with block B is 2T because there are two cables connected with block B.
And since motion only happens along the y prime direction, we can apply the principle of linear impulse and momentum along the y prime direction. But also remember, block A and block B are connected through a continuous cable. Therefore, based on the dependent motion analysis, we can derive that at any given instance, the speed of block B equals to negative one half times the speed of block A. Therefore, based on this, we can write this equation. Again, it has two unknowns, T, the tension force, and VAX2, which is the final speed of block A. Combine this with our previous equation. We have two equations, two unknowns, and we can solve for these two unknowns simultaneously. And using VAX2, we can solve for the velocity of block B at a time equals to six seconds, which is our answer here. Negative sign here indicates that block B is going to move downwards, which is as expected.